God. constant mm. we put our trust in. Thank you, Jesus. Your love has taken mm. over us. Father, have your way this What morning. is in mind that you're so mindful of it? Yes. But we are so confident in you, the constant, in you, oh God. Hallelujah. We put our trust in. Ooh. Your love has taken over us. Thank you, God. Thank you. We depend on This morning, we bless your name. And this morning, Father God, we welcome you. Thank you for every situation that we find ourselves in. For the word of the Lord says, in every situation, give him thanks. And so we thank you, because from the rising of the sun, to the going down of the same. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. We bless you for the gathering of the saints, for your peace and for your word. Lord, we, we've worshiped you and we continually worship you. And I ask that our worship comes up to you like a sweet smelling sacrifice, the one that you would accept, a sacrifice that is favorable to you. And as these are drawn to you, that Lord God, you would visit us like never before. Father, cause for our lives to be a reflection of your light, that it would give you glory and draw men nigh unto you, that our lights would not wane nor would they dim. But because you are an everlasting God, the God of all peace, the God of all flesh, we thank you because you hear us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And the people of God will say, Amen. 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 <laughs> How many of us are just roaring to hear God go? Listen, as, as is our custom here in Scriptures of the Prophet, kingdom greetings to every one of you. Mother Boatman, God bless you. Apostle Cassandra, Suki. My wife is here with us this morning. Prophet Azuri is here with us this morning. Good morning to every one of you. Apostle Samuel, to Willette, uh, Hyacinth, 
uh, Jay, God bless you. Um, Shantae, Elise, April, uh, Joseph is here. Pastor Gloria, God bless you. Tonya, Tonya is here with us in the room. Jeremiah, uh, V, Prophetess Dana, Elma, Imago, Tonio, God bless you. Blessed, Bukola, Sarah, Deja, Dami, Umfon, Janelle, and each and every one of you, I pray that you receive the measure of what God has for you this morning. I, I, I asked God what we should be speaking on. And um, I was brainstorming with my wife because I had quite a number of topics that God has spoken concerning. But I, I wanted something to be reflective. I, I guess because more today is our 10th year anniversary, you know, of our wedding anniversary. And I thought that it'd be significant and when I say significant, significant to address the purpose that God gives us, whereby we're not undermined or where we don't allow ourselves to be forced by norms or standards of the world. I, am I speaking to somebody this morning? And so I, I had to go out. So I said to my wife, I said, listen, pick, pick three topics. And when, we, when I get back, we're going to brainstorm and, and find which one the Lord would have us meditate concerning. And as I came, I surely had one. And she said, let your light so shine amongst men. And it, it was ironic because it was what was heavy in my spirit. What kind of light do we produce? And what light speaks to the countenance of men? What light is speaking concerning you? And from where do we draw the inspiration of our light from? I, I, it's in Matthew 5 where it says that you are the salt of the earth. And then it says further that if the salt loses its savour, how then can it be made salty again? So that means that there's a flavour. That there is something that causes for the earth itself to be likened to that which is seasoned and ready for consumption. But at the same time, the same scripture says that it, it is not good any longer for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men if that doesn't have the nutrition or more or less the savour, the taste that it's supposed to. And I likened it to light because the very next verse, which is very common to everybody, it says that we are the light of the world. And so therefore it says a, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You are light. It's like a lighthouse. How many people have seen a lighthouse? In, in Florida and in the coastline, sometimes when I leave Orlando and, and come like into St. Petersburg, for example, for those who are probably familiar, there's a lighthouse on what seems to be an elevated rock that is high on the beach platform. And when you look at that lighthouse in the daytime, it's, it's almost like a structure is just there. But I implore you to look closely. You would see a fine lamp that seems to go in circles and emit this light that revolves, but you do not see the power of the light almost immediately. But at night, everything changes because the coastline is darker. As a matter of fact, no matter how much illumination of the beams of light that come from vehicles, then you see the lighthouse come into its own. And the Bible is speaking to a liking, a simile of this city that is on a hill. This lighthouse is so high you, can, you cannot hide it no matter what you do because by its function, it's deliberately put in a situation where if coast guards were not there to be able to tell you what it does, you probably will be able to work it out yourself. What does that lighthouse do? It's a system that helps navigate or helps sailors to navigate the waters safely. The light emits such a powerful radiance that sailors cannot go aground or cause for their ships to become shipwrecked. Likened to that is the fact that you look upon it and you can have direction. You would hear those who tell you, for example, oh, uh, the, you, if you come into this birthing place, B-E-R-T-H-I-N-G, this is the depth of the waters. And so you see boys, B-U-O-Y-S, that are dangling on the water tops. Amen. 
and it tells you by their colors the depths of these waters so that the, the, the sailors know how to navigate themselves so that they do not come to a place where they could inadvertently become shipwrecked and likewise when we look at who we are in christ we're likened to this kind of light but i believe that the light also goes far and beyond what it just emits because one of the questions i had is how do you maintain the lighthouse do we consider the lighthouse or we're just so used to hearing about the light that comes from the lighthouse i i look at how the lighthouse is built what does the lighthouse rest upon? There, there must be something about the structure in itself that carries the lighthouse. Because let me tell you something, folks. In studying the lighthouse, it goes through a consistent pattern of seasons. That the times when the waves are still, and the times when it's rough, that the times when the rains come and the visibility is so poor, oh my goodness, the times when there's a great turbulence, and even the people to whom the lighthouse serves possibly are far away from any form of danger or inkling of danger. And you begin to think and ask yourself this question, how was the lighthouse built? Then I realized that the consistency of the lighthouse has to do with the foundation upon which it's set. It's, it's rocky, it's, it's solid, it's literally foundation strong into the very premise by which it's been set upon you can't just build a lighthouse and expect that the structure will just sit that means the brains the the engineers the the the, the people who have thought about setting it have considered very strongly the depth by which the structure itself will be seated so that by the time it's built there are designs that are carried out by engineers and uh, uh, I'll, I'll call them mathematical uh, surveyors who determine how nature acts upon the structure of the lighthouse. I, I hope somebody can catch what I'm saying. I, I'm trying to paint a picture to make the believer understand who they truly are. The, the lighthouse is a representation the Holy Spirit gave about who we are in Christ. But what foundations are you set upon? I, I, I urge you to come with me as we explore how a lighthouse is literally set. The Bible speaks about the wise man and the foolish man. It says one built his house upon the sand. And when the waves came, the waves speak to nature. It speaks to life. The ways are also a simile to the things that a man would necessarily encounter in his lifetime. It says the waves came bashing and the structure of the house that he built was washed away. How far was the roots, should I say, of his mindset to build that house on, the snow, on, on sand? What does sand signify? Sand is very, it's fine, it's like silt. Fine can, sand can be easily dislodged. I, 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 I implore you to take a parcel of sand in your hand and pour water on it, and you'll be fast amazed how quickly the sand will disappear from your hands. Have you been to the beach side? Just take some sand in your hand and put it by the water. And before you raise your hand out of the same water, you probably have no more sand left in your hand. And you begin to fathom and ask yourself, how did this man think to build a house on sand? Now, is it possible to build on sand? Yes, it is possible. But have you considered the depths by which the foundation of that house has to stand? I, I put it to you as a geography major that the deeper you dig into sand, you're still only going to find sand. Because the propagation of sand comes not from anything that is sedimentary, but that is loose. So by, by virtue and the disposition of what we know and what we see, it only makes sense that when the waves come, when waters come, the force and the magnitude causes for everything to be separated. Therefore, the structure of the house built cannot stand. So I, I put it to you and I that that was an unwise decision. It, it did not bear the constants 
of considering longevity, of the assault of patterns of weather and times that would come against the house. I, I, I bet you probably as the house topples, the roof probably comes off. If it doesn't come off, maybe the wind's so strong that it could literally shift the position of the house and by the dynamics of sand, it begins to literally further it away from where it was. And by the time you can say, ha, it probably comes into pieces. So such is the depth of that thinking pattern that I put it to us that that was a foolish decision to have built that way. As a matter of fact, let's put it this way, it could have been a properly designed house, structured fully, as concrete as you might have it, but because the foundation upon which it sits isn't solid enough, something definitely would go wrong. Because no matter how deep he goes, the, fun the funneling, the, the, uh, the piling of the cement that may have been used will not have been sufficient enough to hold that kind of structure when nature, life, and everything that comes with keeping a home or house speaks. And in evidence and contrast, it speaks about the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. Now that catches my attention, folks. Why? Because when I then begin to compare and contrast the lighthouse, I see a fine similarity. I see something that has come not from an ocular vision, but there's a testimony of the longevity, the sustainability, without contradicting the elements that are necessary by their own standards, which means the rains will come, you can't stop it. The sun would come, you can't stop it. The moon time, the times of silence would come, and the rocky times when the winds are fierce, ferocious. And so by contrast, we know that they exist. But in that time, what has been the mindset? And so the wise man says, if I build on this rock, the, the rocks are tectonic. And by the plates that shift from time to time, we can gauge it. We, we can look and ascribe cement and how far it will hold because cement will hold onto the rocks. We, we can build and guard against the foundation because we know that in building that, we have built a structure so stable and so deep becomes that foundation and that platform that you're confident to build on it. And so the wise man builds structures on the very foundations of the rock. Jesus is our rock. His word is the solid word upon which we stand, established such that when man steps onto it, every structure that follows the will the perfect will of God begins to take shape and form. Matthew 5 says that you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And so I likened his structure to the lighthouse. The lighthouse becomes a reference by which when I look at the antecedents of man, then we see the purpose by which God establishes him because he has established himself in God. I might speak to somebody this morning. God's word is established, but are you established in God? Because to become the frame of God, to become the nature of God, to become his purpose here on the face of the earth, there must be something that translates and also opens you to the viability that when men see you, they can recognize who you are. You can distinctively tell the difference between the one who has set him or herself in the heart of God, the things of his kingdom, the one who lives and breathes God, regardless of what men say. Jesus said the same thing in John when he said that he is the light of the world. And as children of God, we should be the light that continues to emanate. But how do we do? And by looking at the model of the lighthouse, it became apparent to me how we do. Because by contrast, the white house or the lighthouse, I beg your pardon, seems to have a consistent color. Oftentimes it's white. I believe that white stands for purity. White also gives, let me say, the essence 
of some form of clarity. You can detect something white from, a, from afar off. So if a lighthouse was dark, that in itself already builds an issue. Sailors and, and navigators of the seas had worked it out even by, by naval contrast, the reason why it was necessary to make lighthouses white. And by looking at the fact that what not only was it pleasing, it is a reflective color that allows the navigator to be able to understand the structure that is before him. It's like when you work in the construction industries, for those who know about cranes that are risen mile, mile, mile high above sky towers and stuff. If you look at the head of a crane, you notice a light that flashes and that light flashes consistently. Why? Because they have come to know that aviational practices cause for vehicles in the air to travel, helicopters, short planes, and more. But can you imagine if a crane rises just slightly above the clouds or is hidden in the clouds and there's no light to warn the pilot that there's a crane there, what would happen is you would crash into it and that could be fatal. Years ago, I witnessed the physical crash that happened in London. It was a very, very misty day. And what had happened was we, we, we noticed this helicopter and from my car, we heard this and the next thing I saw blades. And this particular blade fell from me not less than a quarter of a mile away on the very same road that I was in central London. It happened to be that when the accident investigators began to investigate, it became very clear that the crane operators had not put the light on. And because it was so misty, the helicopter had flown through the misty clouds, not knowing that there was a crane there, it came crashing down. It's a terrible find. It was a terrible experience and something to witness. And likened to that, a lighthouse's light is to bring warning and to illuminate the surroundings. I have a question for you. Does the light in you illuminate for the purposes of godliness? And what does your light attract? What does the light mean? Do we understand the purpose of the light? What the light speaks to? And above all, does the light in you glorify God? Is God pleased with what comes out of you? Do we look for the opportunities that uh, allow us to be very Christ-like? Do we consistently lift not just ourselves, but others to do that which is right and pleasing before God? Do, does God take the center the epicenter of your life and my life. Such that in all that you do, however mindful you are, men can see and glorify God. Can they say, she's a lighthouse? We, we often recite the scripture that says that the Lord is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my footpath. But do we truly understand what it means and do we walk it because the bible tells me that god is light and if god is light what then do i live because his light shines so bright that in its radiation there must be a practicality that speaks to the consistency and the nature of god inside a believer can you imagine a lighthouse that doesn't operate any longer the kind of chaos that will come upon the seas. I watched a film many years ago titled The Lighthouse. I, I'm not sure if it's still available. Something happened in the film that when everything else in the town where the lighthouse was located had gone dark, the men of the town made it a desperate consensus amongst them to make sure that the lighthouse continually had light. Because in a part where a storm came, it broke through the windows of the lighthouse and shattered the bulb that causes for the light to be rotated among the seas. Their town was a strategic vessel passageway that ships, sailors, and even aircraft traveled in order to deliver. It so happened that when this particular storm came and blew the light out, not only was the water in such total darkness, there was chaos that happened on the sea, so many deliveries could not be made and lives were lost. 
the men came together and realized that it was necessary for them to protect the lighthouse at all cost. That stared me and brings me to the remembrance. Do you protect the light of God that is inside you? What do you do concerning the light? In the book of Matthew 5, it says that you are the light of the world. And it's something and a verse that we're so, so constantly aware of. But here's what amazes me and triggers the essence of knowing who I am as I believe you also in Christ. It says no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Another, another one says no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. Another version says you cannot light a lamp and put it on the table. It says it's placed on a stand. The men of that town knew that they could not have a place where the lighthouse was not operating. They knew that the light had to be on. They knew because of the safety that it produced and the fact that it caused for those that relied on it to travel without fail, travel without error, travel without incident, travel without accident. But it was purposeful. The Bible says that when you place that lamp, that light on the stand, it tells you that it gives light to everyone in the house. Have you ever shut your house, put off the lights and take a candle and put it in the center and light it up? I guarantee you, it illuminates the house. And God calls you like that candlestick. God calls you like the lighthouse. The power of the lighthouse is such that when sailors notice it from afar off, they're thankful. I, I, I've spoken to some naval folk who travel the seas. And when you hear, okay, let, let me talk about my father, for example, who used to be in the Navy as a mechanical engineer. And I asked him one day when I was quite young, what are one of the experiences of being on the ship? My father was on the HMS Ark Royal. And he speaks from not just being the only black officer on board, but the things that he experienced. But one thing he often talked about, which I thought was amazing, was the lighthouse. The sailors require that the lighthouse works and remains constantly managed and maintained. Otherwise, if the, if the, if the lighthouse is not, then there's the possibility that they themselves will find themselves in danger. What do you do, people of God, to consistently make sure that you're fine-tuned? Is there a reason why every man and woman should maintain the lighthouse that is inside of them? Let me, let me take your hearts and minds to Scripture. In the book of Colossians chapter 4, in verse 23, it says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So one of the things that I believe Colossians points to that allows God's glory to be seen is what you do concerning you for the Lord before even the people. Is God satisfied with your life? Is God happy with the choices and the decisions that you make? The Bible often tells us and reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we thank, we're thankful for repentance. We're thankful for brokenness. We're thankful for coming into the place of intimacy. We're thankful for the admonition that we receive. We're thankful that the word rebukes us. We're thankful that the word corrects us. We're thankful that the word brings us admonishment. We're thankful that the word brings us correction and order. The word brings us direction. Do we walk faithfully with God? The Bible says Enoch walked faithfully with God and it pleased God to take him away. So the examples of men that we can look at their walk and what defined them in God. Is your life predicated on knowing that continually and daily you're not conformed to the world as it says in the book of Romans, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says that by testing these things, you and I come to be able to discern what the will of God is.
You and I know what is good. You know what God considers to be acceptable, what is perfect in his eyes. I was speaking to one of my sons and daughters yesterday and we were discussing about what is good and what is the good will of God or rather what is the acceptable and perfect will of God. I realized that in order for your light to have the power that it's supposed to emanate, the consistency is you knowing that which is good, acceptable and perfect as the will of God. The Bible tells you, it says, do not let even your good be evil spoken of. Considering the fact, by challenging yourself, that even if it's good, is it good by the nature and the standard of God? As we say, not every good counsel is godly counsel. Those who are unbelievers say things that are good, but they, do they stand up to the measure of what qualifies the good of God? Does it speak intrinsically of the nature of God? I challenge somebody in this room to reconsider, to reevaluate the very things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis if it speaks about that which is the good will of God. Is it something that by admission you can literally say, I have assumed the nature of God, therefore this is acceptable. Now, it is another thing for it to be acceptable in order for it to pass the test. Is it perfect by the measure of God? Am I speaking to somebody this morning? I, I really want to get deep and tear into the light. In other words, what I'm saying is it might be good because good can describe the will of God if it's acceptable. Now, it might be an act of goodwill it might be a demonstration of what we consider to be Christian, like quote unquote. But I think men and women of God who have born, who have been born of the Spirit, baptized and become born again, no longer to no longer can consider living in an illusion. The illusion that because I do this and it's good, God will be happy with it. Well, this is where you and I come to demarcate the difference between what is good and what is evil. Amen. So if God's will is good, what if one comes and speaks something that sounds good, but hasn't got God inside it? How do you take the decision? The experiences that we have when we call ourselves Christians or believers, we need to begin to dissect deeply if the manner and nature by which we walk is the will of God. If the will of God says, I want you to go left and keep going left, because it is necessary that you go left so that those coming would follow suit. But here, here you are. But, but God, how can I go left? Have you seen what is in front of me in the left? It's mushy. It, the, the road ain't clear. As a matter of fact, it looks like there's a brick wall right up there. But he says, that's where I want you to go. And one stops to reconsider. Uh, did I hear God? <laughs> because if you look to the right, it's open. It's airy. I mean, look at the people going through here. But hold on. Have you considered that he knows the end from the beginning? Have you considered that that which is acceptable to God further begins to solidify the nature of God to the one who has faith in God and walks like God? If the Bible says that in the days of Noah, there was none upright like him except him whom God found, what do you think? It was about Noah that not just stirred the writer to tell us the nature of Noah, but also the kind of man he was in his time. There must have been a light in Noah that stood out. It was possibly much more than an example to the people who refused to entertain the God and the light that showed through Noah. So he says, go left. I put it to you that the challenges that we have is having to accept an illusion by inexplic inexplicably admitting our living bodies to accept that which we can define rather than that which God speaks to. Go left. Albeit that we consider the verse in Scripture that says, narrow is the path that leads to life. Few find it. 
but great is the path that leads to destruction. Many go through it. And I begin to exercise and find for myself that what defines the light of God in you is the one who irrevocably, by any form, accepts without undermining themselves and undermining the Spirit of God to follow through. You're, you're, not, con you're not questioning. There's something we do in the study in theology. It's called the anthropocentricity of walking the walk of faith. That means that by that faith and its admission, I don't question what God tells me because I trust him to take me through it. He says, nobody told me that the road would be easy, but he's not brought me this far to leave me. How then would I become a witness if by faith I have not been able to become obedient to his word? By following the command to its extent, to its end, he glorifies himself when by faith I have walked it without compromise. The light inside of you speaks about the one who refuses to be defined by the things that are an illusion. When Paul spoke about defining God's will, one thing he mentioned was that it can be good, but if the good is not acceptable to God, then there's an error. You can't take petrol, unleaded fuel, and put it into a lantern and expect there not to be an explosion. But hold on, the unleaded fuel would help to produce light. But is it the kind of fuel? Now, have you done what is wrong? Not necessarily. But the impracticality of it is putting a dangerous fuel, ethanol, into a container that is not designed for and the application is not specific to its intent. You're looking to light a lamp to have in a house. So what then are we supposed to put in that lantern, you ask? Well, I think we realize that it's paraffin. And why is it paraffin? Because it's a lesser concentrate where the explosive particles or parts of it have been chemically removed and the paraffin has been made for that environment and container. This is differentiating that which is good. But what is acceptable? It is acceptable that the paraffin is what is right for that container so that when the wick is lit, the light emits. But now imagine putting the fuel unleaded inside the same lantern and lighting that wick. God help us, we just lit an inferno. Many of us have lit infernos. C can I speak to somebody here this morning? Many of us have lit infernos because we have followed after something that we believed or we felt was good, but failed to implicitly examine if it was acceptable. Let, let me give another instance. Two separate fuels. One is diesel and the other is unleaded. Something happened to us recently. I think I shared it. Sometimes we can be absent-minded and God needs you to be alert not only to pass the test of his sovereignty but to continue remain the light of his sovereignty. Sometimes absent-mindedness can preclude that maybe our hearts are stayed on something or we're troubled. But even in the troubling, do you rectify the troubling? We got into the gas station and I fueled the truck with unleaded fuel instead of diesel. Why? Because by our home, the gas station has the, the, uh, the, the, the pumps differently. The diesel is before the unleaded, but in this gas station, the unleaded was before the diesel. So absent-mindedly, I just picked it and put it into the vehicle. And I started pumping gas until I looked on the counter and saw that I had filled it up to almost 50 pounds. And I was startled and alarmed. And I quickly stopped. I felt like I'd blown a fuse. Because what happens? Well, let's, let's examine what the fuel do. But someone said, but they're both fuel and they drive vehicles. Yes, but they do different things. Diesel travels further. Its viscosity is thicker than unleaded fuel. 
Putting diesel in an unleaded car would literally block it. But putting unleaded fuel in a diesel car does literally the same thing. And by causing greater sediment, it impacts the nozzles, the engine bay, and then if we're not careful, we blow the head gasket. So fortunately, we hadn't left the gas station when I found out what had happened. But it comes at a cost to fix. And God is saying, I don't need you to come to the place where it will cost you to fix an error. I don't need you to come to the place to fix what will have caused an inferno or the inferno that you have caused. No wonder he says in Romans 12 that be transformed daily in the renewing of your minds that you will be able to discern that which is the will of God. Had I paid closer attention to the pumps, even though they had been exchanged because they were not the same as where we live, I would not have had to pay much more. I paid nearly 10 times. No, I beg your pardon. I paid nearly five times more than what I put in the car just to get it fixed. Because now we had to get a, a fuel fixer. We had to wait. We, fortunately, we hadn't left. We had not started the car to travel at the point where the unleaded fuel would have run its way through the engine and caused permanent damage. Your light is important to God because God relies on you to be able to illuminate a world that is filled with dark premises of evil. It stuns us to sit there and see that when the fuel fixer came, had to empty the whole tank. And in emptying the whole tank, had to get the nozzles cleaned. In our case, because we hadn't started the vehicle to go anywhere, there wasn't a reason to. But that cost 200. I, I shared it with Prophet Azuri when it happened. I was so broken and hurt. I told my wife, I said, this can happen again. But, but Paul says something here. And many of us sometimes ignore what Jesus himself said because Paul repeated the same thing. Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And I look at the light that he speaks to by saying that because we become transformed, you can then do that which is perfect. The lighthouse in you has a perfect radiation if it is set, I beg your pardon, illumination if it is set by God and the things of his kingdom. By the banner of the mercies of God, Paul makes the appeal to us Helping us to emphasize continually that in spite, and I wanted you to hear me, that in spite of your imperfections, there is something that continues to drive you to the place of perfection because in Christ, you have availed yourself to become capable by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are not thrown back against the wall. We, we don't walk in the place of disobedience and we don't carry or entertain the carnality of this world because we're not casual about the things of God. You can walk in the fullness of obedience and the confidence of it and by that, the light of God in you becomes radiated far more than you can imagine. The fuel fixer comes, fix the car and he leaves. We have to put now the right fuel back in. Do you know every time we get to the gas station, my wife reminds me, remember, remember, it's, it's diesel. It's not all, <laughs> it's funny, but it causes you to practice being more discerning. For the light of God to reflect by purpose and its standard in you, people of God, God is expecting you to be greatly discerning. You and I cannot do things blindly. Or assume that the territories by which we find ourselves operate within the same function of where we have come from or where we have been used to. Remember, he says, you shall go into all the ends of the earth as witnesses. A witness carries the standard of God. How do you treat people when you get along the way? It speaks to the light of God inside of you. Do we deal one another with protracted kindness? How do you want to be treated? We, we, we often say, treat others as you would like to be treated. But I ask you this question. Do you truly consider the depths, the meaning, and the language of what you are saying? Are we kind because of an expectation? Or we're kind because we understand the measure of God's kindness? I believe God's kindness comes to us by huge form of responsibility. 
It's called love. But what kind of love do we emit? In showing kindness, is our kindness from a place of arrogance? The persons might not know, but if someone who is deep in the spirit observes you, can they assume or see that your kindness comes from a place of meekness? Your light is supposed to bring a people drawn because of your experiences. The things that have solidified your feet in Christ. One who has walked the walls of pain, the streets of pain, and understand what it means to be a comfort to another. Oh, can I, can I preach to somebody this morning? Or can I teach something this morning? Your light speaks to those who understand the path that you've come from because when you begin to see the things that take place in this life, you know how to respond to it. You're likened to the good Samaritan. In the Bible times, it tells us that the Samaritan and this man, this person that was hijacked by robbers, their, 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 their nations and their people, their tribes were never, never at friends. The Samaritans were not the kind of people that they wanted to be found with, but here is this man who's attacked by robbers and the Samaritan leaves everything just to attend to him. What, what kind of light comes out of you? Because I put it to you that you are likened to the lighthouse that has received all the knocks and the bends and the pushes and the rains and the storms, the travails, but the lamp is protected. I told her the story of the men who did everything in that little, that little, little tiny village, that little town, to make sure that the lighthouse where all the ships and aircraft passed through was kept safe. Do we keep the light of God in our lives safe enough that when people see the projection of it, they're glad? They're thankful that you were sent in their lives or they walked through your path. Because I put it to somebody here this morning that God is also speaking and testing you based on the depth of humility that you show. We, we are an ambitious people. And I think it's amazing that we all have the, the, the depths of ambition in us. But does ambition push you out of the remits of understanding by something you're called to be humble? Because in as much as we understand love, I believe that the practicality of love speaks to one whose heart is humble. So I deem for myself that there was a humility that came upon the Samaritan. He, he didn't say to himself, well, they don't like us. They don't talk to us. They want nothing to do with us. So I'm just going to walk past him, uh, Apostle Frederick, and, and say, well, he's none of my business. He was robbed. So, well, let him deal himself. God is not asking you to submit the grace of his light in you just to your own fellow man that you're used to. Now, okay, y'all didn't hear me on this side. Let, let, me, let me look on my iPad and turn to this left side because I, I think I, I, I kind of get the left side responding a bit more. Am I saying something that is driving straight into you and making you reconsider? Your light is meant to be the illumination that speaks about the excellence of God regardless of whom you come across. The Samaritan in this day didn't pick up his cell phone and begin to enter into dangerous gossip with uh, his kind or his kindred and begin to say, oh my God, you, you, you need to see who, I, who is on the floor right in front of me. I was just going through Trafalgar Square and this, this fool had this accident. You know, you know that one that we saw down our city the other day? <laughs> no. No, he didn't pick up the phone and then put on his camera and begin to film a man who's downtrodden and hurt and broken. A man who's bleeding from an accident. W what kind of light truly is in you? Is it one that would truly cause you to abase yourself? Because when Jesus asked us to let our light shine before men, Jesus didn't say, let it shine only to your kindred. Let it shine only to those who come from your father's side of the house or from your mother's side of the house. Let it only come from the people that you went to school with. Let it only come from the people that have become elitist in their network towards you. Let your light only shine amongst the cliques. He, he did not say that. He didn't say, let your light only shine amongst those who show you favor or open doors of opportunities to you. He didn't say, let your light only shine within the neighborhood and the people that you have become entangled with as friends. Uh-uh. He said, men, that the evidence of God's love 
should be the greatest thing that comes from you and that men will be able to see and glorify God. That men will be able to see the light of the lighthouse when they find themselves in some kind of upheaval or danger and be glad that they saw the lighthouse. The lighthouse is the structure high enough by which when it begins to radiate and turn around, those who see its light are thankful for it. Uh, am I speaking to somebody this morning? <laughs> The, the Samaritan turns around and says, you know what? I, I, I got to get this guy to a hospital. The, the Samaritan runs out of his car and sees this car wreck. He begins to notice that there's a fire that has come from under the vehicle. The, the, the Samaritan dares everything that is within reasoning and begins to tackle the vehicle to make sure he can get this occupant out of it. And like into the Samaritan in the scripture, the Bible says he takes him to an inn. And he says, listen, care for this man. Oh, as a matter of fact, don't worry about the bill. I, I will pay it. it it's mine. I, 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 I would foot everything. I, I'm going to go on a journey, but I'm going to come back. Here's my name. Here's my number. Here's how to get me. Should he want anything, administer it. I will sort the bill out. Jesus paid the price and the bill was paid in full concerning you and me. How come we still hold back from a price that was paid unconditionally? We choose whom we want to show favor to. Okay, I, I know y'all won't say anything. We choose whom we want to represent. We choose whom we, we want to sit down and eat with. Okay, and I know you all don't like me for that one. It's okay. We choose whom we listen to even when we know deep in our spirits that they're gossiping and bringing malicious slander. I tell you by the words of the Lord, whose light emanates in you and does it give God glory? We do things in the hidden places not knowing that there's a construct of evil that takes place. And it takes for the same evil men that we sit with who would go out and say, did you know that he was in this place? Did you know that he just visited the brothel? Did you know that this is what he did? And by the following of this, there's a challenge that begins to speak to the light that is inside you. Your light has to glorify men, but how come your light seems to be overshadowed by the eclipse of darkness? How come your light doesn't give people the vision that is necessary to show God's love and his hand far outstretched? I ask myself. Light is important to illuminate. I, can, <laughs> I, I cannot but emphasize the power of light. Are you, are you guys here with me this morning? But look, look at what Colossians 3 says here in verse 25. Apostle Cassandra, here, can I, can, I read, can I read this out? Because I think it will blow somebody's mind this morning. I, I want to teach something this morning. Colossians 3.25. It says, but if you do what is wrong, you will be Pay back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. S sorry, help me, Holy Spirit. Are you telling me that we know the right thing to do? And the question is, do we truly do it? Do we consider that God don't do no favoritism? Do we consider that there's an expectation called payback after the wrong that you have done. Mother Boatman, I put it to you that the Good Samaritan knew the conscience of God. The Good Samaritan understood that without having to consider any provocations of enmity of any persons or a people. It was necessary that not only did he have a heart that was forgiving, which is important, but he had to show the heart that yielded to serve another one who was down. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? Uh, okay, let, let, me, let me turn to the right side of my iPad.
I, I've been turning to the left side for a while. Let me look on the right side. Yes, yes. How can you have a light that does not compel men to be drawn, but yet seems to attract that which is evil? Because that's the only word I'm going to use to qualify it. If it does not attract the godliness of men, of, of, sorry, of God in men, then what is attracting is evil. Someone was speaking with me the other day, and one of my daughters also mentioned the same thing when, was, when she mentioned the spirit of Jezebel. And I said, let me correct something. We need to come out of charismatic and new age teachings and go back to what the word says. It was, the Bible says, an evil spirit overtook him. It does not tell you the spirit was the spirit of Isaiah. The spirit, no, the spirit that falls upon a person is significant to the attitudes, the nature of how God created that person. When the mantle that operates within them eviscerates all that is the consistency of God. But when it speaks about an evil spirit, an evil spirit can take over an individual and begin to cause for them to come into a direct what? A direct outplay of what the spirit allows their attitudes to be informed by. The Bible says Jezebel was wicked. That means Jezebel had a wicked spirit. Ahab was a wicked king. Ahab had a wicked spirit. What does the wicked spirit fall under? That which is evil. The light draws a likeness to itself. Ahab is drawn to a woman filled with such forms of derogatory wickedness. They become a team. What kind of light do you draw? What kind of men are drawn to you? What, what do you stand by that causes men to speak of the same thing concerning you? And, 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 and let, me, let me give you an expression of what Jesus meant by that. If you turn with me to your Bibles in, in John chapter 13. In, in John chapter 13, in verse 35. I love what it says here. As a matter of fact, let, let's go on. Let's go to the top first. So in verse 34, hear me. It says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. Let, let, let me say the way Jesus would have said it. I, I, I just want to get into character. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Did you all hear that? Jesus is saying, you guys love one another, right? Okay. Now, it, it, it's a command that I have given that is new. And he says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Can men look at you, people of God, and call you truly disciples of Jesus Christ? Can men look at you and determine that that command separates you from anything else that they've ever known or come across? I put it to you that we need a heart check. Because if Jesus speaks it, then mighty are we if we uphold the righteousness of Christ in truth. Because the Good Samaritan exemplifies the same construct without thought. The man spends his money. He has no idea what the cost will come to. But there's one thing in his heart, the love that his man should live. If there was an offense that had come from this same man's tribe against his, his heart showed a light of forgiveness. Because I believe that in order for any man to have a relationship that is fortified, that is protected, and that is kept by the will of God, by dimensions in itself, the ability to have a heart that forgives. But I'll tell you something about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a contrary being. Neither is it an assault to you. But forgiveness is a construct by God that you would understand his will and purpose, not just for the one that you forgive, but that your heart is released to expound 
and create the characteristics of the experience of the nature of God because it is love. How many have spoken against you in practice and you've ha had uh, the, the, the should, I, should I say, the, the ability that forces the nature of God in you to comply? Now, he hear me. There's a difference where you forgive those who have acted in ignorance. There's a difference in forgiving those who have willfully come against to hurt you. And there's a difference separating yourself from those who walk in evil. But what about forgiving your brother who has acted out of sorts? Restoring the place of faith, relationship, as God called it to be. A prophet rises another, against another prophet because someone offered that prophet something to rise against that voice simply because they can't control or keep that voice. That's a different construct to your prophet friend who has risen against you or erred against you. I would use the word erred against you. That you have sought one another and laid your burdens of forgiveness by confessing your transgressions to one another. Why? Because the Bible says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to themselves. So I put it to you that if that has not come into its own and you go about to speak and prophesy and say, thus is the word of the Lord, we can tell you that that's false. Because you're operating then under the knowledge of you being a prophet rather than the heart of the prophet that has been received because of the contention that has now been brought out and sorted out. And therefore, the grace of God in its magnitude and its might and mercy has moved you to the next level. No wonder he says, if you have an altar with this one, put your anointing, put whatever it is you think you have at the altar and go and make peace. Why? Because the sovereignty of God has been bashed by men. The nature of God has been demoralized in itself by men who have refused to be acquainted to his order and process. I realize that his word even says that if a man's way pleases God, somebody help me out here, he will cause for even thine enemies to be at peace with him. The borders of God concerning the light in you is a likelihood that, let me tell you something, folks, let's not get this wrong. You and I will be offended. Men will offend you. Some, it is a capacity that is intentional. For others, it is not intentional. Can you, by necessity, practicalize what the offenses are through discernment? And when I say that, without personifying the offense to yourself, can you tell if it's of the devil or if it was the flesh? For example, let, let me say this to you. I may offend you. But no, as a matter of fact, let me change that. I will offend you. You know why? Because I might say things that do not necessarily agree to either a cultural or a traditional practiced by yourself. The traditions of men, the culture of an environment. But it will be up to you to learn that the one who seemingly may have brought you offense hasn't done so intentionally. Let me give you an example. If you go to an Asian nation, you don't shake them with your left hand. Because by custom, it's an insult. But this gentleman is left-handed. <laughs> Never thought there was anything wrong. He goes to a business meeting. And the first thing he does was to shake with his left hand. Now, they didn't receive it, but they smiled. As soon as he enters in the boardroom, that one thing cost him and the contract was over. What does it speak to? Do you learn the nature of God? Because sometimes we turn around and say, well, the devil did this. The devil did that. Do you learn the nature of God? Do you understand God? Do you also realize that variety, as we call it the spice of life, often opens the likelihood that we're still ignorant? How many cultures globally do you as a believer know, recognize, and can operate in? How many words, languages, premises can you determine and ascertain 
and walk confidently and boldly in, knowing that God has done it so. That by the measure of it, you can tell the standard of God and how to deal with your fellow brother. The, the Bible speaks about the expectations of the righteous shall not be cut short. I put it to you, people of God, that is speaking to one who has dived deep to not just know him, but to excel in the things that brings him glory. Does your light shine to the point where when men see it, God is glorified? Because I, I, I presume by inference that if that man had studied and asked about the culture, he would have acted appropriately. But did what he do, what he did, was it wrong? No, it wasn't. Because there are other nations that if you shook with your left hand, it would not mean anything. God is asking you to give yourself up to him that he would have the dominion that opens the expressivity of his kingdom in your life. That in your actions and your expressions, men will be drawn and the likelihood is they would want to become part, participants of the glory of God in your life, which brings God glory. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? Is somebody learning something this morning? Because I, I feel that there's a liberation that God is trying to bring into a people of this generation. How do you serve God? Does your serving God please men to be excited to want to do the same thing that God himself is moved? Are we accountable to God to the point where even when men begin to ponder they can tell that we're established. Let, let's go to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. Let, let's read something here. And I believe that we can use this as a foundational litmus test that speaks to you and I. In Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 25 to 27, follow me. It says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Y'all didn't see this one coming. It says, ponder the path of your feet. Where do your feet go? Who do you follow? Who follows after you? We're happy to run to a, a, a mega church that speaks of tens of thousands of people, but there's a brokenness that you can't seem to explain. We're happy to run into environments that have grandiosity, but we still come out empty. Did you ponder the path that you decided to walk upon? But here's, here's what Solomon says. He says, and let all your ways be established. Okay, y'all didn't see that one coming. Where are your feet established? Now he says here, he says, do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Can, can somebody help me here? Do not turn to the right or the left, but remove your foot from evil. That means one individual has found a landscape of dishonesty, entered and caused for themselves a reputation that begins to flourish with disdain and disorder. A reputation that should not be found of one who has bequeathed, bequeathed the world and its carnality, but somehow has found themselves as a willing volunteer for that which is not of God. I'm probably saying, but your eyes were supposed to be straight in the first place. Who is the author and the finisher of your faith? Who do you follow after? Do you ponder, do you consider the places that you're going? I have often said this in the house. If the words of God and the teachings and our fellowship in Christ does not bring conviction, then there's a problem somewhere. We need to re-examine ourselves. What kind of light then are we passing through? We're quick to run and ruminate the language of gossip malicious slander and you have no idea that there are people watching you and wondering what kind of light is in you 
We create a reputation dangerous because there's a motivation to destroy another because we follow through after one that we have commissioned as an idol before God. And he said, that shall have no other God before me. We take the words of others hook, line, and sinker, and then we begin to savor and flavor through with them, forgetting that there is a God who is a judge over all evil. And we ask ourselves the question, is there value that drives the proposition of God in you and reflects the sovereignty of God and also exemplifies his honor, causing men to appreciate your life, your walk, and wanting to be drawn closer to God. Why then would we sing, draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord? If you sing that kind of worship, is your life a true reflection of one who is drawn? Or it's an underline of a perspective that is heavily diluted because we know how to play the hide and seek game. Does your light reflect purpose and power? Are men brought to true conviction because the holiness of God in you is not a recreation, but a true reflection of the purity of God? Someone put up a post that I answered a while ago. And he said, no man can be perfect. <laughs> and I smiled. I smiled because I realized the petulant ignorance and how we make an escape channel for our own innate decisions that cause us grief and possibly grieve the Holy Spirit. He said, be ye thou perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Why? Did he not know that there would be challenges? He knew. That's why he said, you're the light of the world. Did he not know that there will be failings? He knew. That's why he said, let me be the lamp unto your feet. Did he not know that dark times might come and we might be in flock to them? He did. That's why he said, now let me be the light unto your path. It's there in the book of Psalms 119. Meaning that he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm imploring you, you. Yes, you, the believer, the day you said I do to me. <laughs> he said, the day you said you do, that you would form the habit of relationship with me. That you will not just choose parts that are okay, but you will consider all. To come into the place of devotion consistently, to change you, to change your perceptions, to change your thoughts, and to know that which is good and acceptable before God. That men too will be glorified because you become the window of the expressions of God. No wonder he said, where, well, you know what? Where, where's you go? He says, I shall lead you. He says, my commandment is like a lamp and the law is light. And that same law is a reproof of instructions for the way of life. So people of God, can I ask a question? Why do we deplete the essence of the light of God, which is his own approval, which is what he calls us to, and which he stands by? In, in, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world. That, that is saying to you folks that there's danger in the world. I think that's the bottom line. But it says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Meaning that there's a tendency. Y'all hear me? There's a tendency for man to fall short. There's a tendency to backslide. There's a tendency for temptation. Aha, y'all didn't hear me this morning. There's a tendency to fail. But it says, by being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now hear this, that by testing, testing. Can I say that here to somebody this morning? By testing, you may discern what is the will of God. You can tell what is good and acceptable and perfect that means that there is 
a bane, B-A-N-E, of curiosity that causes for you and I burst of Christ to become those who no longer are seated in captivity, not trapped by a mindset that speaks to the exposure of carnality and the involvement thereof. A people born of the nature of God. No wonder in Leviticus it says, you shall be holy unto me. Why? For I am the Lord and I am holy and I have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Why would God call you to be his? Because the alliance of the covenant of the oath he kept was that you and I would not be yoked with that which is what? Against his nature, the light of the lighthouse. The lighthouse speaks to you. The foundations upon which the lighthouse sits and is established is the words of the Lord. The firmament within which the lighthouse finds itself, the seas, the, the, the weather patterns are the things that are in, 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 in itself nature. The applications of life, the constructs of the custody that men find themselves in, knowing that in it all, there must be a standing somewhere. How can your light go far into places dim? Are the things that we think about holy, godly, and righteous? What do you meditate upon? What glorifies God? It's, a, it's, it's likened to the one who has determined in themselves to walk that which is divine. Because when you say your word is alive to my feet and to my pathway, you're saying this is the divine light that I would follow through. Because when he reveals himself to you, your surroundings are illuminated. Which means, people of God, that the trajectory of God's nature is such that the people who dwelled in a form of darkness begin to see light in you. My wife called me one day from work. And she said, baby, you won't believe what just happened. I said, what? And she said, this guy's around her. She works in a construction company. She said, they swear blind. F this, it, that, and that, and that. And she was like, wow, she never said a word. I put it to you that people are watching you even when you don't speak. I put it to you that the reason why people will pay attention to you is because of the kind of light that comes through you. Has he not started the work? Would he not complete it? And she said, one day, they came right up to her and apologized for speaking in a manner that they knew was against her spirit. And she looks at them in amazement and she's like, what y'all talking about? And people of God, from that day onwards, when they get themselves in the conversations, even when she was around them, if they misspoke in a language that was unethical, they'll go, oops, sorry, miss. Why? Because there's a light in you it dwells. It dwells into the innermost regions of yourself. Why? Because you have become a participant of the nature of God. Are you the nature of God? If he says, be ye perfect as my God in heaven is perfect, it speaks about the character of God. What is in your character that speaks the radiance of the glory of God and speaks clearly of his light? Your light is meant to shine out of darkness. Your light is supposed to be from a heart that speaks of the knowledge of the glory of God through Christ. Why did you give your life to Christ? If not because you knew that we stayed in a place called perpetual darkness, which is sin. When David wrote in Psalm 36, y'all, let me tell you something here. Psalm 36 blows my mind because sometimes I think until we sit into it and begin to realize the heart. Permit me to read Psalm 36. David said, sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. That blew my mind. That made me begin to ask questions. Another version of scripture says transgression. I've got two Bibles here. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. 
So if the likened, the likened is drawn to the likened, there is a similar pattern of function because they respond to the same thing. But you have become the antidote to that error. And 36 proves it. It says they have no fear of God at all, but you have the fear of God. Amen, somebody. You have the fear of God. In verse 2, it says, in their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or do good. Let me tell you what the other scripture, I have another, my remember, it says, he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. Wow. In verse 4, it says, They lie awake at night, hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness, it reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, and your justice like the ocean's depths. You care for people and animals alike, O oh Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O oh God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which they see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Let me stop there. Do you deal with true justice or you're partial? Do you wield partiality because of what you receive? Because Psalm 36 speaks to those who are blinded by the God of this world. And by being blinded, they're kept from seeing God's light. And there's power behind the light of God. Let me tell you why. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 3, it says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. And I put it to you this morning. You are not perishing. You're stable in the things of God. You know by the knowledge of your relationship in him that he keeps you whole. And because you're whole, in Matthew 26, uh, sorry, in Matthew 6, I beg your pardon, he, he describes the essence of the wholeness of your body. Let, let's, let's see it. In Matthew chapter 6, oh, where's Matthew when you want Matthew? Okay, Matthew's, Matthew, here we go. In Matthew chapter 6, 22 to 23, what does it say here? It says your eyes, that's you and I, your eye, can, can I repeat that again? Your eye, that means the vision, the things you see. The things you respond to are as a result of what you see. Do, do we agree? All right, let me talk to the people, you know, the others in the room. I put it to you that the things you respond to physically as a result of what your eye sees. Matthew 6, in verse 23, it proves it. He says, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? If the light in you and I is dark, what depth of darkness? Are we walking or operating in? Because something about this kind of darkness is the fact that it, it begins to masquerade like as if it were light. And this is why you can discern 
when people walk in an evil operation. The light in you is the light of God. Jesus said, and I'd like to end it here. I, in John chapter 8, he said, I, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do we have the light of Christ, the one who illuminates the world? A man who was scorned and jeered, spat at, they slapped him, they stabbed him in the side. They, they nailed him to the cross and they called him all sorts of words. They mocked him, put the thorn of crowns on his head and say, uh, well, you said you're the king of the Jews. On, on his epitaph, they wrote the word Inri to mock him. Inri meaning Eanimsu, the one who calls, Rihansu, the one that says he is king. And when they went to Pontius Pilate to remove it, because it was professing him as a king, Pilate said, that which I have written shall not be removed. So yes, even in death, a king who stood and reminded us all what it means to be the true light. A light that you're supposed to give to others so that they would come into the knowledge of him by disconnecting themselves permanently from the appeal of darkness. And that's why he said, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. What do people see in you? When people look at you, can they see Christ Jesus? Because in, in Psalm 36 that I read, it did say that in your light do we see light. And if Jesus is the light of the world and the light or the life of the light, then there's an embodiment in you that should know that the spiritual light of God also becomes the expressions of the things that you do physically. God is putting the charge in you and I a greater depth of revelation that does what? Opens you and I into the corridors of his secret place that entreats your surroundings to derive greater in him that which brings great pleasure and glory to his name. Because in order for God to be glorified, the light that you have in Christ speaks greatly because of who he is. Jesus became the radiance of the glory of God in a world that is strewn in so much darkness. Jesus became the first lighthouse that men became acquainted to. And while many scorned, disbelieved, walked in error and perpetual darkness and wickedness. Those who have come to the knowledge of sonship in him today can be accounted for, for standing holy on the one true light given to mankind. I put it to you as the scriptures say, that you are the light of the world and like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden no one's light can be put under a basket if they're in Christ no one's light can be dimmed if they stand for the righteousness of God God is calling the people who after being transformed to become witnesses sent into all of the earth will continue to have a faith-filled relationship. Is it easy to walk perfectly before God? I want to tell someone here that I've done it before and you can. But we can make a practice of it if our hearts and our minds are transformed and renewed daily. It takes work. 
to disabuse yourself of thoughts that are cattle. It takes a lot of willpower because the body is weak, but the spirit is willing. The company you keep, those who embrace you, those who intercede, those who stand with you, speaks greatly to the custom of God that his proficiency is seen and made known through all the earth through you because you are the expression of God the day you said, I do. Darkness cannot overcome the light of God in you because you know that he is the life giver and you become the light in the world of today. I charge you, brethren. I charge you, my sisters. I charge everyone under the sound of my voice that God is calling you to be separate and separated from those things that can dim the light of God in you. Those things that don't bring God glory. Do not participate in slander. Don't tell lies. Don't gossip. Don't fornicate. Do not be part of perversions, adultery. D don't. Don't tell an untrue word against the company because someone wants to ruin them. Do not join the fellowship of those who speak evil of the household of fellowship in an effort to glorify God. Let him direct your paths in all your ways that we become a people that are servants who have cultivated the heart and the mind of Christ. I bless you and I pray that this teaching has revealed the heart of God and convinced and not confused men that we were bought at a price. And because of that price, we glorify God in our bodies by the things that bring him pleasure. God bless you and I'd like to yield the mic to the moderators and the platform and either to the room. And I pray that this teaching has blessed someone and brought a conviction of doing that which is right and upheld by God. God bless you. You're going quiet on me. Okay, let's do it this way. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Jesus. You're going quiet on me. Heavy, 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 heavy. Oh, my Jesus. God, I got about 20 pages. Oh, my Jesus. Thank you, Apostle. Oh, my Jesus. I'm telling you, if you want to get, if you, oh, Jesus, I got to go back. You know, I think about, uh, thank, thank God for my Apostle, Apostle Isaiah. He, he is so thorough, so thorough. I'm, I'm in the college. I'm with a college professor. Oh my Jesus. You know, this is such a good word about the light, the light of Christ. And if, if you want to come up higher, you got to I will sharpen your iron. Iron I R O I R O N. And you know what? This is so good. It it just it, even the more I think about the word says if you purge yourself from these and want to come up higher. You go to where the higher standard, it, God's called to a higher standard. And this light, even bringing out about the light, the light of Christ and the, oh my God, I just go to, I just don't pick out something uh, about the sand and, you know, how the, 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 God, the, the house is built on the sand and how the sand is. I get the sand can be easily dislodged. I got that wrote down. You, you can easily, if you build your house upon a sand, you can sink. But you got to make sure that you put it on rock, on a, on a, a sturdy foundation of rock, because it's going to be rocky times. There's going to be things that's going to come and try the house. Rocky times is going to come, and if the cement, if it's if the cement will hold onto the rocks, if it's cemented down, if you hold onto the rock, which is the firm foundation, you will be able to make it in these difficult times. Oh my Jesus. And you brought out so much good things. Uh -huh. Okay, with being a light, with being the light of Christ, it brings warning. 
you know, you gotta let the light flow. Shine. You don't even have to say anything, but just going into a room or going to places. If you got the light of Christ on the inside, people, by this shall all men know by the by the light that is so so shine. It's like a higher calling. God has called us to to come up higher, and to do that, you got to be uh, you know, you got to die to flesh. That's it. That die to flesh. Oh my God. Oh God. Oh, necessary to protect the light at all times. You got to be able to, to try to protect yourself. Even the way that the way I think about protecting yourself is not being connected with any and everybody and carrying on every kind of conversation and walking circumspectly. Thank you, Daddy. Not as fools, but as wise people of the light. You got to walk in the wisdom of God. And it was just so brought out so much. I got to replay it again and uh, not transform form to the world. God, uh, th- that we may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's a higher place that God's calling us to. It's just so wonderful. And I thought about the Samaritan, because I promise you, Apostle, when you go through things and say things, it hits where it hits me right in the middle of my eyes, it, because it's just what I brought up about the Samaritan, about even with your own sect, just sticking with your own sect. But the Samaritan went beyond his sect, his group of people that's like him. He went to the weak and beggar. He went to the ones that didn't have anything. And when you have the light of Christ, you don't, you don't, you don't, thank you. You no respect of persons. You go to the one that don't have nothing, you know, but, and then render a hand to be a light to them. And you can bring them from, from the guttermost to the othermost. Come on. And uh, just so much. I, I just, oh my Jesus, it was so good. The light brings warning. It brings warning. Oh, you know, it, you know, does God take a center of your light that man can see? He should be the center. Jesus is the center. You know, that song, Jesus is the center of my light. You, you, you should be the center that people can see, not a dim light. But that's why the way words to let your light so shine. You're supposed to outshine the other religions or whatever that don't even, you know, it's just living one way it's behind a, in a church to be another way after they get out, you know, clubbing and drinking and karate, you know, because I've I lived in that way. I lived that way when I, my mother brought me up in the church and, and that's what we did. Before we, the church was over, we would get out and before we church, we got to figure out what we're going to get out of nickel bag at, back then, nickel bag, reaper, you know, so in, 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 in this light, this is caused to come up higher, to lay aside, to let that go, to perfect, per, if any man purge himself, you got to let that stuff go because God calls us to a higher standard of righteousness and holiness and that people can see it. Oh my Jesus, it was just so much. Oh God, who to listen to? I'm telling you, Apostle, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in college. I'm in college now. I'm just trying to get all the notes. I just, I got to play the tape back, but it's really even the more, if you want to come up higher, if you want to come up, you will hear what the word of God is saying because God wants to perfect us in righteousness and holiness and that people can see because so many people have a form of godliness, but denying the power. And the word of God said, from, from such turn away, you got to get away from just any old thing, but you, you're called to be the light of Christ because he, he, he showed himself to be that example and we're to follow his steps. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I stopped. But I got so much from this. It's just, I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Because I'm a scribe. I, I love to write. I love to write. I love to, okay, not yoked up with that, which is against nature. Not being yoked up with anything. Just being yoked up with anybody. You got you to gotta make a difference. And in this walk, it's, it's just, just, just <laughs> righteousness and holiness and purity. And that, that, that you know, that, that, that way you can, God can answer our prayers quicker. You know, oh my God, it's just so much. It's so much. It's so much. But I thank you again for this apostle. I'm going to play this tape over and over that it can be sitting down in my soul that I can let my light so shine, that I can come up higher, that I can be a living epistle read of man, not just read and reading, but that they may see through the lifestyle and the way that you live because people are watching you. That's the main thing you say. People, whether they say anything or not, they're watching us because there's few people that's really taking a stand for a whole, for righteousness now. And so, so many have fallen. Oh yeah, that really, yeah, that people here in church. I know they how they do. I know it. they're watching our life. So we got to even more come up higher to a higher standard of righteousness and holiness. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So needed to be taught. It's it's just 
Oh my God, it's right anyhow. So I bless you. I bless you, my apostle. Thank you again. And I'll tell you, I'm learning and I'm grabbing hold to the whole horns of the altar into the word that I can be pleasing to the Lord, that it can be well done, thou good and faithful servant. So thank you, apostle. Thank you for the word. God bless each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. <laughs> God bless you. God, God bless you. I, I, I wouldn't say that. One of the things I, I keep learning every day is God has an expectation that we should walk like him. We should be like him and we should sound like him. That's why he says that my sheep, they hear my voice and the strangers they will not follow because they know that I am God. They know that I am God. And that is very critical in the kind of light that comes through you. Well, what kind of light comes through you? Do, do people see you and they can tell, oh, that guy, oh, he's a reveler. Oh, he likes drinking. Oh, that one, uh, he got too many girls going on. He, you know, he played behind the scenes. Oh, that one, he go like he married, but every girl, every girl don't be right down there. So, you know, who do he, who do he think he fooling? You know, he's standing on the poop and he's shouting, doing this and he's hollering and clapping and everybody know him. He, he, you know, you know, those kind of things. And God is expecting that men make a demand on the righteousness of Christ that is in you. If the righteous expectations of a man of God or woman of God are not cut short, then I put it to you that because of the time that you spend in fellowship, the fact that you carry a very strong emblem of God, you're, you're, you're the replica here on earth as Christ was, then men, Men recognize and see and tell. What do men say of you or about you? Do, do men make mockery of God in your life? Because the things that we do are not consistent to the fabric of his nature. Can, can, that, can that be said? Is, is that possible? And I believe that this is where God is speaking to our hearts. And when he said in scripture, he says, come up higher. Th there's an expectation. I often say new day, new devils. And every devil comes with something different. If you leave a place that was occupied by demons initially, let me just give you a picture uh, before I go to Apostle Cassandra. If you leave a place that was occupied by wickedness, evil demons, cleaned out, but it's not fortified. You've not put godly protections there. The word, prayer, worship, and what have you. It says the demon comes back, finding it unoccupied, brings 7, 10, 20 more deadly than itself to take over again. So every day comes with something new and something more terrible in itself. But are you fortified enough are you, even to our youths, what kind of light do your peers see in your life? What, a, a disrespectful, brazen, young man and woman or lad who say, you can't tell me what to do, don't, tell, don't talk to me, I don't need to listen to you. But you, the young man and woman, grafted in and ingrained in the things of God, Exodus 20 says that you honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that your God has given you. So that means dishonor to them would shorten your days. I, I believe that's exactly what it means. But a generation that we can't pinpoint and say that they were raised by men and women of godly reputation. And when you see a wayward system of a young, growing folk we really need to check the fabric of the home because the light that they exhibit is as a result of the light that radiates to them and by which they find fellowship. Am I speaking to somebody here? God sees what you probably do in the secret because he would reward you for it. But nonetheless, God rejoices in us. Why? Because 
we have become participants in, in the sufferings of Jesus Christ so that God becomes overjoyed when his glory is revealed in our lives. That, that got me when Peter said that. I, I, I thought about it when I was studying. Right? So, wow. We participated. We're participants in what Jesus has gone through. And so because we rejoice in the knowledge of it, God is overjoyed when his glory is revealed in our lives. Is God overjoyed when men see that his glory in your life is an open exhibition? Apostle Cassandra, what say you, woman of God? Thank you, Mother Bonham. <laughs> Blessings to your apostle. I'm telling you, this has been a divine word from above. Um, I heard the spirit of the Lord saying on today that this is the season and the time of exposure. I also heard the spirit of the Lord saying that he's given to you uh Apostle Isaiah, a keen anointing. Only a keen anointing can minister the word like this and identify and pull out the deep uh, revelations that God has in this word. So he's, he's displayed upon you a keen anointing, but this is the season of, and the set time of exposure. And I hear the spirit of the Lord saying that it is time to do a self-examination. We have heard the word on today. It's time for us to go back and do a self-reflection and see how we can be that light, how we can stay in that light. We do not want to remain in the dark places in the dark places we can't see our way but it is when we are exposed to the light of the word of god we can see everything that we need to see so god says on this morning today is a new day i'm doing a new thing i have called you to a higher place in me says the spirit of the living god and i bless god on today because he gave me isaiah 60 and one and he he brought me to Isaiah 60 and 1 in the Passion Translation that says, rise up in splendor. Guess what? When he says rise up in splendor, that means I'm calling you. I'm calling you to rise. It is a command. He commands us to rise. He says, rise up in splendor and, he, and be radiant. He wants you to be radiant for your light has dawned and Yahweh's glory now streams from you you it is so exciting and illuminating and it's just uh just so much of a great experience to see you know the words that it says now streams from you it's for you it's for you because of the accent it's because of what i have called you to do says the spirit of the living god i have given my light to you my glory to you i'm causing you to rise up in splendor rise up in splendor and let the light shine so that that every area of darkness can be exposed so that my true word can be exposed so that you can receive a greater portion of what I have for you so that you can complete the assignments that I have for you so that you can receive the increase and in the promotion that I have for you but you can't get it if you remain in darkness if you remain in darkness you know the word of God says Thy word that I've hidden in my heart that I may not what I may not sin against thee. He say, I have caused the lamp unto thy feet and the light unto thy pathway. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy pathway. He's telling you, just stay in my word, stay in my presence, and you will remain in the light. You will remain going on that straight and narrow path. And I hear the spirit of the living God says, when and exposure comes and the light shines and my glory is revealed there you will be in the midst 
of the greatness, the great things that I have for you, the great things, the great and mighty things. According to Jeremiah 30 and three, he said, if you call, I will answer. Lord, just give me your light. Lord God, let your glory be revealed. Lord God. He said, if you call, I will answer. I would show you the great and mighty things that thou know it's not. So we bless God on today. I'm telling you, this has been a great word and I'm telling you it's time to do a self-reflection, self-examination and see what areas that you can allow, what areas that you know that are dark areas in your life that you know need to be exposed, need to be corrected. When the light shines, guess what we can see clearly because we can make the corrections that we need to make. Hallelujah. I just bless God. I'm telling you, I'm so full on this word today and I could go on and on, but I know that time does not permit me to go on and on, but I bless God for you, man of God on this morning. And I thank God for the way he uses you to minister the word effectively. Hallelujah. Blessings to everyone Amen. in the room. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I was listening to the word and it's true. What do you use to expose, if not light? And when light shines upon a thing, whatever is hidden is revealed. Whatever is hidden is exposed. Whatever was hiding itself can now be seen. And it is authoritative of God. Ooh. It is authoritative of God by his own demand that it should be so. But my prayer is that the light of God, when even set upon you, would reveal the glory of God in you rather than that which is dark. My prayer, my prayer is a sincere prayer that every man is judged to have found in himself by Christ the light of God. Because if he speaks to us as the light of the world, May we continually be the participants. I think when I was teaching earlier on, I was speaking about how we are participants with Christ. I was speaking about understanding that by his nature, his character, and all that he represented, we are of the same. How, how can you be born again and you do not equate to the participation of the sufferings of Christ? How, how can that be possible? Then what were you born of or what were you born by? But I know that the light of God, oof, shabbat be katahaya. Okay, let, let me just hold myself. God, God bless you, my God. Uh, Prophet Azuri, are you there? Okay. Um, oh, okay, all right, okay. I, I just, I'm sorry, folks. I, I just got a message I was just trying to respond to. I'm going to ask that before Sonny takes us into worship. I think Courtney is with us this morning, and um, I wondered if Courtney would like to minister to us this morning for the next seven, ten minutes, because I know she's got to go out too. And then we hand over to Sonny, who will then take us into another atmosphere of worship before we come. How many, how many people were blessed this morning? How, how many people received a word this morning Amen. how, how many people Amen. say that i know Please. that the heart yes. of god made present for me something that i may have not possibly uh considered in this light hey, here we go light but i know that his word is true his word is yea and amen because i'll tell you something i was satisfied i felt like can i can i explain it I felt like I had gone to this waterfall and I'd opened my mouth and had drunk till I watched my belly literally grow so big that it wouldn't burst. And even if it felt uncomfortable, I just wanted to keep on drinking. How many people know what I'm talking about? That That's... That's that place that I want to be. Yeah, there's this song that says, I want to be where you are. You all know that song? I yeah. want to be where you are. Why would the minstrel say, I want to be there? Because all oh, the overwhelming endless love, God, it, it satisfies me to be there. And I realize God is calling you to the place where there's a longing a thirsting that grabs you. Why? Because you will radiate that which you have drawn from. Ooh, am I speaking to somebody this morning? 
Am I speaking to somebody this morning? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Courtney, do you want to lead us? And then, uh, Sonny, and then, my God, God bless you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. If we could just take a moment to meditate and digest that word just a little bit longer um, as I uh, lead us a little bit deeper into the presence of the Lord. Um, light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spin with you. I'll sing that again. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see your beauty that made my heart adore you. Hope of a life spin with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. All together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it cost to have my sin hey, upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to have my sin upon the cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to cast my gaze. All 
altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy. All together, wonderful to me. So I cry out, Oh Jesus, Oh Jesus, hey. Your presence is heaven to me, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh, your presence is heaven to me, oh Jesus. Oh, my sweet Jesus, oh, your presence is heaven to me, oh, Jesus, oh, oh, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to me Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all from beginning to the end You'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, cause nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything Amen. 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 While, while Courtney was just ministering to us, I just kept on hearing the, the words. Jesus at the center of it all. I, I asked somebody here this morning, or this afternoon, or the time that you hear me speaking wherever you may be located. Is Jesus at the center of everything in your life? Can I ask somebody to search deep within them and honestly answer that in every decision making that Jesus truly is at the center of it all? My father used to say that a good name is better than gold. So every time we went to school back when we were kids, we, we had to act the way we were trained, the way we were raised, so that we don't bring a bad report, which means that in being trained, we became the eyes, the reflection 
of the one who raised us. So that men will be able to say, oh, wow, have you, have you seen that kid? He's, he's a son of Mother Boatman. Have you, have you seen that little girl? You know, she, she's the daughter. They, they referred you to the one who has raised you. Why? Because men can see the handwork and they glorify God because when they speak good of the one who has raised you, you become the example, the exemplifying nature of their nature in you. I just heard Jesus at the center of it all. Will someone make Jesus the center of everything in their lives this morning? Bro, prophetess, why am I up? Because I, I just know that God is staring us in a direction that is purposed by himself alone. God, God is not concerned about what men think. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? God is not concerned about what men say. He's concerned about what you believe he says and how you respond to what he says. Prophet Weimer, I just want to bless you. And also I see Katarina with us on the platform. Um, let, let's let's go to Katarina first and Prophet Weimer, then Sonny. Uh, I think Sonny is getting himself ready to um, bring us into worship. Uh, I, I want to honor every man and woman in the house one more time. Apostle Frederick, Prophet Kathy, uh, the entire fivefold, um, Mama Tar, uh, every single person who's participated with us. Uh, can, can I also apologize? For some reason, the replay was not activated and I do not know how that was missed. So just before we got into the word and all, we had recognized this. So we have managed to professionally record the room. So for those who would want the recording of today, we definitely would get it ready. So if you can send an email, uh, we put the link up there this morning. I think there's, I think there's an email uh that that shows I, I i pray i'm sure that there's an email so if you do see the email please do send an email to us or if you don't go to the instagram link that is there but i'm confident there's an email point there send an email to prophet isaiah at gmail.com and we'll do our best to make sure that we get the audio to you otherwise what we will then do is we will get it available and have it posted onto YouTube, then the link will be available so that you could actually go straight to the link and then you could listen to it there. I duly apologize. It was an oversight on my part. I, I guess I just for some reason missed it or expected that it would be there automatically. Uh, and so I will make sure that today's message is available either as a direct email to you. If it's too large a file, then we would have it posted on YouTube so that you'd have access to it with the link. Um, Katrina, what, what say you, woman of God, uh, before we go to confess? <laughs> I'm sorry, I started off left. <laughs> um, God bless you, man of God. I thank God for this word. I do need it, please, as soon as possible. Um, because God is the center of my life. And you saw me early this morning, and he this is where he told me to stay. But out of, um, my loyalty and wanting to be in so many different spaces. Uh, he, 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 when I, when I didn't, let me get it out. Um, I didn't do what he told me to do. And, um, he was like, I told you exactly what I wanted you to be. <laughs> and, um, here I am. <laughs> And um, so this word that you've preached, I know is I know is something that I need to hear. And I know that um I mean each time I come in here and everything that you have ministered unto me has been truly a blessing. Um and I thank God for it. So please um get me that. Uh, words so that I can 
see what God was saying to me because um, he is the center and it's like an answer to my prayers of, you know, I want to be closer to you. I want to do, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And then just a simple instruction. Um, he's told me a good thing is not a God thing a lot of times. And my good heart gets me in trouble when he tells me to do something because I don't see any harm in it. Oh, I was like, if I can use it, because it's, it's me, I'm Jeremiah. I have different um, profiles so I can so I can still do it. He said, do, but he said, you go in as Katarina. <laughs> and um, so I'm like, Lord, forgive me. I hear you. I'm going to do what you tell me to do when you tell me to do it no matter what. And, um, so please, sir, <laughs> man of God, send me that so I can hear what that says the Lord. God bless you. <laughs> hey, hey, amen. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, it's okay. God, God is, he's kind, he's good. And I, I often say that if there's a conviction, God is speaking. If there isn't, your flesh is moving. You need to find out the one that stabilizes and normalizes you so that we don't pay a later penalty simply because we came out of alignment. That speaks to alignment. And alignment also opens up the nature of the responsibility of obedience. Prophet is why I'm a what say you, woman of God? Blessings, Apostle. Blessings. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. I was just going to text you on WhatsApp uh, quickly. I didn't interrupt. But you so low on my end. I thought it was my side, but I kind of heard uh, Minister Katharina kind of clear. But I'm kind of really struggling to hear you. The blessings are possible. I think she got to reinstall the app like I had to because I couldn't even speak this morning. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you clear. We, we can hear you. I know there's some static, but we can okay. hear you. I'm doing well, like I said. Prophet Wama, can, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, Prophet. Okay. I, I was asking what you wanted to share with us before. Oh, <laughs> wow. Well, blessings to you again. I humbly, uh, when I say those words, they're not cliche, they're not just um, empty words, vain words, random words. But I truly mean that because um, you are so vital to the body of Christ. And I honor the grace on your life and the honor in your life. And just being the servant of God and just being in position to wash the saints' feet and to all the respective titles. I see my sister Zarell in the room, the uh, Mother Boatman, um, everybody else that marks and in their respectful callings, those in the VIP lounge, just everybody in the room. Uh, thank God for you all today. Um, he said, where the presence of the Lord is or where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah, but i just been in a, um, some of you know, <laughs> and some who do not know I'm on assignment currently. I'm in Liberia. So I have been here actually today, Friday. Um, I'll be two weeks since I've been here. So to God be the glory. Um, all is well uh, by the grace of God. But i just been in that place. And when I log in, it was just a perfect timing. Just been in that place of worship has been in that place uh, with the Lord. And this morning, uh, the Lord had given me a rima, and it was so powerful. And I'm super so uh, next Sunday, uh, I'm invited to minister as a guest speaker. And then he told me to share it now in the room. But I was in the book of uh, Zechariah, and Zechariah chapter one, when um, he encountered the angel and the angel bringing the message from the Lord. And he goes to tell them, uh, tell him 
that he was angry. God was angry with the nations uh, because um, even though God was angry with the children of Israel, was angry with Israel, but they had gone too far uh, by touching his children, his people. And that was just so a powerful word the other night. But today was like part two. And then he took me further into the chapter two. And then the word became Rhema when he said to um, the servant of God that Satan, the accuser, had accused Joshua. And God said, I'm not listening to his accusation. And matter of fact, I'm changing his clothing even though it's a sinful code, but I'm changing it. And I'm not looking at the accusation. Then he goes to ask, he said, but what do you see? And then he begins to tell him the things that he sees. And then the angel comes back and says, the Lord says, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. And it was just, I have read that so many times, but today it was just in depth. And it just came as a rainbow. And I truly believe to us in this room is a powerful moment. A lot of us are looking at what do we see? You know, some of us, uh, God have given us assignment with ministry. God, God have given us assignment with family, marriage, children, uh, business, different things of that nature. And sometimes in seasons, you will have people that will come and they will be zealous apostle and they say, I will stand with you and it's going to be theirs or, you know, I, I'm contributing this and I'm, and I'm giving my time and my resources and different things and not just the ministry, but every uh, arena of our lives. And then when push comes to shove and when we really get to that place and you see people fall away and you see people leave and you see different things happen and not just people. And sometimes you experience the shutting of doors and different things. And uh, I believe in my spirit. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I believe some of us right now in this room, we are at that place. And the Lord is asking, what do you see? We might be seeing the trials. We might be seeing the tribulations. We might be seeing the famine. We might be seeing uh, those that left. We might be uh, hearing the accusation of the enemy and et cetera, et cetera. But the Lord said, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Not by might, not by androskia, but androskia. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. And by his spirit is going to draw us closer to that place of worship. And by his spirit is going to draw closer to that place with intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his spirit, we're going to uh, learn not to lean on our own understanding but in all our ways that we're going to trust the Lord, that we're truly going to lift up our eyes onto the hills for whence cometh our help. For indeed, the Lord is the one that brings us help, that he will turn away the captivity and it will be like a dream. Oh, thank you, Father, that he will turn away our captivity and it will be like a dream. So the word of the Lord this hour, uh, Apostle, he says, what do you see? And the Lord said, it's okay. Hallelujah. Somebody might be experiencing some issues with the finances, and it's okay. Some people, it might be the health. Some people, it might be the children. Some people, it might be the job. Some people, it might be the sense of direction that you need right now. Some people, it might be... Uh, accusations against you hallelujah some people might be dealing with bloodline issues amen glory to god but the lord said it will not be by might and not by power and i feel that word strong and he began to tell me he said favor what are you seeing amen glory to god he said don't worry it will not be by might mm -hmm. and it will not be by power it will not be by your intellect and uh, apostle the lord just took me into worship and i and i just begin to worship even uh, from the scripture of Psalm 20 that says some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. Amen. Glory to God. And I wasn't saying it from a literal standpoint, but I was telling God, I said, Lord, I trust you because I don't even have a horse or a chariot. Amen. Glory to God. Some people trust in the intellect. God, my intellect is zero. My intellect means nothing. My, my, my ability 
to even comprehend means nothing. Amen. Glory to God from that standpoint, from that context. And I said, Lord, I, I don't even have no pedigree. My educational status means nothing. Indeed, it will be by your spirit. Amen. So I just want to share that word with God's people and encourage you. Amen. Glory to God. Don't faint. Don't give up. Stand in the Lord. Let the weak say, I am strong. Indeed, we have our boldness in the Lord. Amen. And the Lord said, it will not be by might. It will not be by your connections. It will not be by the promises of man, but it will be by his spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Apostle. Wow, it, it will not be by your intellect. It will not be by your doing. It will not be by what you can influence. It will be by his spirit. And I believe that that speaks to a word, a prophetic, a prophetic word that, we, that, I, that the Lord released from me some, not too long ago, when the Lord said, he has come to audit the hearts of men and give according to men and to nations that which they deserve. So that means you cannot influence what God will do, but he will judge you by what has come through you. Hmm. I said yesterday to someone, I said, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of God than even the hands of men. I, I pray, God bless you, Prophet Islam, I really pray the hearts and the eyes of men are set on the things of God's kingdom. Because it is not about eating and drinking, but that the glory of God is revealed in the lives of men. Because God, God would write everything concerning you and I. And guess what? Men will see it. While yet we're on earth, men will see it, testify and witness to it. I pray that we walk righteously with God all of the days of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, prophetess. God bless you. Sonia, are you ready for us, sir? We've got just about eight more minutes before we bring this to a close. And I, I've got to disappear too because it's my 10-year anniversary today, people of God. It's our 10-year wedding anniversary and we're just so thankful to God for how far he has brought us. And we've prayed and spoken into the lives of others, those waiting to be married, those married, and even those who through their marriages, there are those tough times and those tough moments that we speak a blessing on the hand of God to bring ease in your homes, in your families, and to bring a complete oneness in him, in your marriages. Is marriage easy? I'll be honest, no because they're two different people, but with the same God. Coming into the institution that he mandated and created, that when we enter into it and come into alignment with his word, now you see, not our flesh, not what you want, not what you think, not what the world says, but what he instituted, that it shall be well with you. And that if we walk uprightly with him, he makes all things beautiful in this time. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sonny, I'm sorry, I took just one minute out of your time. Can you just lead us to worship in the next seven minutes so that we can let the people of God go back their way? So, oh, wow. Wow. I, I want to use this opportunity to celebrate you, uh, Apostle. <laughs> you and Mom, happy, happy, glorious anniversary. I, I want to say that... <clears throat> May God bless you, okay? May God bless you. You are, you are, a, you are a blessing to the body of Christ already. And I, I tap into this grace. Yes, I tap into this grace. I pray, I pray that myself and my wife, we also live together to witness such a, a moment like this. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. We bless you. God bless you so much. And special greeting to everybody on this platform. Uh, I see um, Mother Bootman and my, my, my sister, Prophetess Zuri, and Dr. Apostle Cassandra. God bless you for also coming on. I see everybody. I see everybody. And I want us to worship the Lord. And today, I have a gift for Apostle. I have a gift for Apostle. So, after I minister, 
I'll just let my gift out. <laughs> bless us, bless, I'm, bless I'm us. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Oh, Hallelujah. My God. Yes, Jesus. Oh. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, yes. come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, Reveal the glory of the living God. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. Reveal the glory of the living God. Let the weight of your glory cover us. Let the life of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the weight of your glory. Let the weight of your glory fall. Let the weight of your glory cover us. Let the life of your river flow. Let the truth. Of your glory, fall. 
my time mm. and daddy I want to um, give you my surprise so I came here with my wife so she's going to miss that a song oh, a wow. song <laughs> for daddy yes this is a surprise I have for you I came here so you change the key to C for us so uh -huh, so you can minister any song of your choice. Any song. Any song of your choice. So this song, it actually goes to daddy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey. 
Yes, Lord. Come on, somebody. He is the God. Yes, you are the Lord. Come on, somebody. Let's just worship just for them. Yes, you are. Yes, you are the Lord. Bless you, Daddy. Wow. Father, I bless your son and your daughter. I thank you that even raising their voices as one, you find pleasure even in their hearts of worship. And you find pleasure in the ones who also follow suit and worship them for and with you. Lord, we bless you in this hour. I speak to their marriage. I speak to their union. And I use them also as a point of contact to those who are in the fellowship and house of marriage. That God, Amen. they be a blessing. <laughs> Amen. That God, you touch every area of their lives and show through revelation who you are in their lives. Yes, Lord. I use them, O oh God, as a point of celebration that if men did not even know their challenges and how they sing this way, they would never have known that the hand of God truly is upon them. I ask you, Jesus, to bless them, that you order their footsteps. Amen. And for every man and woman, Amen. that your name is glorified. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit may be with each and every man and woman in this hour as we go. And I decree and declare that surely God's goodness, his mercy, his love, and his light will go before you, be in and with you, and cause for you to continually illuminate a world and draw men unto him because of your faithfulness and obedience, and that his name will be glorified all of the days of your lives. These I ask and I pray for. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I want to say thank you to everybody. It's been an honor. It's been a blessing. I am so touched by the messages. We keep getting more and more. God bless you. If there's anyone who wants to be a blessing to us, hey, y'all got the link up there. So you, you can bless us as the Lord leads you. For those who have stretched out a hand of fellowship into our lives, we are thankful. I pray for every man and woman that as you go out there, God meets you greater than your expectations. God bless you, Mother Boatman. Apostle Cassandra, God bless you. Prophet Azuri, God bless you. Hey, Sonny and your wife, God bless you. Prophetess Weimer, God bless you. May he honor you. Katerina, God bless you. To everyone in the room, I'd love to call everyone here, but God bless you. I've managed to read some of the messages in the comments to Liz, to those who have blessed. Liz, I, I thank God for 41 years in marriage. My goodness. You know what I think of my parents? My parents being, what, 50, what, uh, for nine, five, 55 years for my parents. Sometimes I think back, I'm like, wow, how could it just, if not that it was the Lord. For every person who's celebrating here, who has celebrated, and those who have birthdays, we don't neglect to, to say that God bless you and bring you great increase, bring you wisdom and cause for you to be enlarged fruitfully. Prophet Kathy, every person here, April, Janelle, will let God bless you. Listen, Mama Tar, Dr. Ross, if I have missed someone's name, please forgive me. I, I'm, I'm just as excited you, as you guys are that God indeed is our King. Hey, go out there, occupy. Be the light to the world. And when we come back and meet in fellowship on Monday, I'm sure there will be a testimony. And hey, I, I got a wild card for you guys coming this following week. Yeah, just keep your hearts out because we're going to have some folk up on this platform speaking while I can also sit down in the audience and listen. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> listen, guys, God bless you. We love you. And I thank God for all that is happening in your lives. And this room will end. 
Oh yes, I forgot to say, as soon as we're done, we're going to have this recording up. Uh, we've got the editor right here with us. So we're going to put the audio in and get it ready to go onto YouTube. So stay out and watch out for my Instagram account because we've been told that's the easiest way to do it. We'll put the link through the Instagram account so you guys can literally go to the YouTube video and get today's recording. I apologize for the anomaly of not watching out for the room to be on replay. I promise it will not happen again. Listen, go out there, guys, and have your best of days. God bless you and keep you. And this room will end in five, four, three, two, one. And shalom, the peace of God to every one of you in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you.